Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at major ethical approaches in our continuing study of biblical ethics. There's a book by the name of Paralandra, written by C.S. Lewis. It's actually part of a trilogy. It's the it's middle book of the trilogy, in which the hero, his name is Ransom, he, he, and it's sci-fi. Let, let me just let you know ahead of time. Not, not particularly good sci-fi necessarily, but uh, it, it fits a need. Uh, and the hero, his name is Ransom, which is going to be just an interesting name. It's unusual, but also it will be symbolic of what he eventually does in the story. And he's, he's teleported, he's transported to the planet of Venus. Now, it's not Venus as we know in our science classes to be, but it's Venus how it was envisioned by C.S. Lewis in this sort of mythical story. Uh, and in his story, it's a world that's largely covered with water, that has, and notice you see the pictures on it, these islands that, that are floating. But because they are floating, they're always moving. Um, and they're sort of moving, you know, because they're the, the, it's a very uh, active planet with these big giant waves, and the islands will go up and down and up and down. And as he's on one of these islands, he's been transported, and that's part of the bigger story, why he's, why he's been there. Um, it's, he, he meets on one of these islands a woman um, and she's there on the island. She's, uh, she's naked and don't want to get too much into that. But it's almost like she's the Eve figure. Uh, so they're on these floating islands, uh, he, and she is an innocent. She doesn't know really the difference between right and wrong. She's never sinned, so it's, it's a flashback to the, to, to the Garden of Eden story. And, and, and Lewis is taking us there deliberately and as he meets her and he begins to speak with her she he finds out that she has been forbidden by the god figure and leel uh, has said that is it is forbidden for her the one the one commandment not eating from the tree of good and evil uh, but rather the one commandment that she's been given is that she's forbidden to go to the fixed lands that is those lands that aren't part of these floating islands lands that don't move lands like we know on, on Earth, you know, we, we don't have floating islands on, on our planet. Our, all of our lands are fixed. But she's not allowed to go to those fixed lands. And so Ransom, who after a while, he's getting a little bit seasick. He's not used to lands that move all the time. And he's saying, uh, well, why can't we go to one of those fixed lands? He's, and she says, well, it's forbidden. And, and he says, well, wait a minute. I come from a, a world where everybody lives on fixed lands. Uh, and that brings up the question, well, if others can live in a fixed land, why can't we? And, and what happens is he realizes with a start that, you know, this is almost like the Eden story, but that he is playing the part of the serpent. He's actually tempting her. And then the story develops after that, and, and uh, a, a, another temp tempter comes along and, and don't want to give, give the plot away. Um, but this brings up the question, where do we get our sense of right and wrong? Who decides whether you can live on the fixed lands or the floating lands? Who decides if I can do this or I can do that? Now, there are two basic views of ethics. The first is called the deontological ethic. The, uh, the view that supports that. And the second one is called the teleological ethic. The deontological ethic, it, it states that the rule determines the result. In other words, you, uh, the, the rule, you have the rule. It's just the way it is. That's, word, that's what ontology is. It's just the way things are. And you have the rule, and then you follow it, and the result's going to come. But you don't look at the result first. You look at the rule first. In teleological ethic, uh, a telos is a purpose uh, for, for, for something being there. And in this case, the result determines the rule. What result do I want to achieve? And then I ask, what do I have to do to get that result? So that in the deontological uh, ethic, the rule is the basis for the action. In the teleological ethic, the result is the, basic, is the basis for the action. What's going to result? And then... I, f I determine what is right and wrong. In the deontological ethic, you say what's right and wrong, and then I do that, and something might result, and might not, we'll, we'll see. In the deontological ethic, 
The rule is good regardless of the result. doesn't matter what the result brings. The rule in itself is good. For example, if the rule is don't kill, then you don't kill. And even if a bad result comes from that, you just don't kill. In the teleological ethic, the rule result is good. Be, or excuse me, the the rule is good because of the result. Um, and so the the question is, well, what what result is it going to bring about? In the deontological ethic, the result is always calculated within the rules. In the teleological ethic, the result sometimes is used to break the rules. And so that's the, the two big spheres of how we do ethics. Now we're going to look at six categories. Um, these are given to us uh, in, uh, in Norm Geisler's book, uh, Christian Ethics, six general categories of ethical principles. Major ethical views. First of all, the first of these is the antinomian view. Uh, namos is the word for law, and anti, of course, is against something. So this is a view that says there's no laws. Uh, anarchy, for example, uh, is, is a view that says, let's just not have any laws. Let's just do whatever we want. Secondly is generalism. In generalism, it says there are no universal laws, but you can have some general rules. But they're, because they're not universal, you can take them, you can leave them, you can break them, you can unbreak them. Uh, you just take them as suggestions instead of a loss. Uh, you can make them stronger than that if you want, but they're not universal. And so they can, they can sort of go anywhere. In situationalism, uh, and this was popularized, and we're going to look a bit later at Fletcher and his situation ethics, uh, he, who said the only real law is love. As, as long as you love everybody, you want to bring about a loving result. Just sort of do what you want. That's situationalism. Next, And the next three are going to be various forms of what we call absolutism. Now, the, those first three, notice, uh, there is no law, there can be general laws, uh, the only law is love, uh, are saying that y there aren't really any absolute laws. But the next three will say, yes, there are, and yet there's going to be differences within those. And so the first is unqualified absolutism that says that no laws should ever be broken. If the law is a law, then the law is a law, and don't break it, no matter what. However, there's also two other formats. One is what we could call conflicting absolutism, and Geisler calls it that, um, and which points out that living in a fallen world means that laws sometimes conflict. And so, therefore, we should do the lesser evil. What, what brings about the lesser evil? You know, I, I, I can't do two things at the same time. Um, and we'll look at examples of that. What's going to bring about lesser evil, lesser harm, and because I understand laws can be in conflict with one another. And then finally, finally is uh, what Geisler calls graded absolutism, where, yes, laws sometimes, not always, but sometimes they can conflict, but we should follow the higher law. For example, if I, um, I have a law of gravity, uh, and, but I take a ball, and I throw it into the air. Now, I haven't broken the law of gravity. I've just put a higher law into effect. I've put the law of inertia, depending on how hard I throw the, the ball. Um, it, w it won't really break it. It will just put a higher force into effect. And graded absolutism is seen in such a way.